Well, hi. Ah, there we go. All righty. Sorry. We're here to look at this Chevy Silverado commercial because it's an example of the culture industry at work. Chevy Silverado factory lifted trucks. Where will they take you? Silverado ZR2, Trail Boss, and Custom Trail Boss. Because adventure is everywhere. No, 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 no. Okay. Indeed, adventure is everywhere. I mean, how could it not be? Um, save that in. Uh, oh, let's say. Let's say classy. Is it sure is? All right. I'm gonna try to go through these little thingies here with you. I'm going to do a lot of pausing and stopping and starting. Culture as product. Well, the product is not the truck. The product is the advertisement. This is something you have to understand. What you are consuming is the advertisement, not the truck. And even when you are driving the truck around, what you are consuming is really the advertisement. So the cultural product is the advertisement. And what kind of product is the advertisement? It's an audiovisual product, right? It's predictability and consumability. It's easy to consume an advertisement. All you got to do is look at it and it's predictable. There's that symbol. Right? Um, it's the Chevy symbol. I think it's recognizable to lots of people. Um, even people who don't recognize, um, you know, specific car brands can probably recognize that that is a car brand. Um, but I bet that logo has a very high percentage um, recognition among people who are in the United States, grew up in U.S. culture, etc. So. That predictability and consumability is built into the fact that that logo, that brand, branding um, is predictable. We know what to expect, and that's part of the consumability of it. That leads into the way it um, feeds on and helps to train our perception. Now, watch what else it does with our perception. I'm going to count something, see if you can tell what I'm counting. Chevy Silverado One, factory lifted two, three, Where will they four, take you? Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, Stop going to Howling Wolf. Um, Howling Wolf is the next thing on my 
cube. So what did I count? 36 of whatever it was I was counting. Oh, I think I didn't count that, so 37. Those were the different shots in a 30 second ad. Less than a second per. Um, that's awfully quick. It's training your perception to perceive in jump cut. Less than a second is not a lot of time for your visual perception, let alone your brain, to make much sense of the image. Um, that's deliberate. That's to um, give you just a flash of whatever it is um, for your brain to process in rapid order. Well, the rapid order, the rapid succession part of your brain guess what, is not the part of your brain that reasons things out very carefully. It's the, it appeals to the part of your brain that um, deals with things at a rapid rate. Um, that's more the kind of part of the brain that has you run from tigers and, and or run towards well, gophers or whatever it is that, um, you know, 100,000, 150,000 years ago, our forebears were chasing down to try and eat. I know, poor little gophers. They're so cute and tasty, I guess. I've never eaten a gopher. Anyway, so the perception, um, and now I'm going to talk very much like a Marxist um, in terms of the way the Marxists uh, old school Marxists talk about how advertising works. Advertising short circuits the rational part of your brain and appeals directly to something like the amygdala. Uh, it goes straight for the, um, pardon this image, goes straight for the brain's gonads, as it were, and uh, grabs you by them um, in that it doesn't give your brain the chance to process any of these images in any sort of sorting out rational process. What is the ad about? Is it about a truck? Hell no. Chevy Silverado factory lifted trucks. Where will they take you? I'm going to tell you diddly squat about the truck. Silverado ZR2, Trail Boss, and Custom Trail Boss. Because adventure is everywhere. It tells you about adventure. Um, I mean, the clue is in the title of the ad. That's what it's telling you. I mean, there were as many images of people uh, whitewater kayaking, climbing rocks, um, getting stuff out of the tailgate to go do something adventurous, et cetera, et cetera. There was much of that kind of images. There were images of the trucks. Uh, and that's what it's really selling. So what it's doing um, is selling you on the idea that the truck is equal to adventure. And so when you buy the truck, you buy adventure. I mean, ads work this way. They're, it's really kind of banal and simplistic to kind of put together how ads uh, turn an object into a, a, a spectacle of, uh, of a feeling and sell you that feeling as, as though the feeling comes with the product. Um, they all do that. Typically, <laughs> typically it's, they appeal to you in terms of a, a couple of base desires, um, sex, excitement, um, <laughs> food and drunkenness, and that's about it. Um, how does this work as a piece of ideology? Well, um, I think that this is going to seem like a leap, um, but I don't care. I'm pretty confident about it. Um, this is a, Chevrolet is an American car company. 
And I want to make the claim that these are very American kinds of images. Look at the people, look at the landscape, look at what it is they're doing. And tell me if these aren't you know, very quintessentially American people. These are not, um, these are not Finns. These are not, uh, these are sure not uh, Slavs. Um, I don't think that these are Brazilians. Um, right? Take a look. Chevy Silverado factory lifted trucks. Where will they take you? One thing, where will they take you? All those places are California. Silverado ZR2, Trail Boss. <laughs> Chevrolet has often associated themselves, um, as does Ford, as does GM, though, I mean, uh, Dodge, though not quite as much with Dodge, oddly. Um, Chevy and Ford especially associate themselves with um, uh, images of Americanism, kind of a jingoistic, nationalistic appeal. So the ideology associating themselves with Americanism is very important to their brand image. They, they associate themselves in that way. So they appeal to a kind of um, nationalism as part of their brand and vice versa. The brand reinforces that ideology. What does it mean to be an American? It means driving trucks around all over the place because damn it, it's your land and no one's going to tell you otherwise. Um, so the ideology here is one very much of a kind of um, a libertarian, go out and do things on your own for your own sake. And um, another thing that I can't help but notice because of my own interests um, is the yeah, ideology the inherent in our society. Take you? I'm just going to wait for it a second. Yeah, as far as I can tell, um, there are no persons in there that I would consider uh, noticeably disabled. Um, so the ideology of ableism is very much present there. So, and that, in terms of my uh, work in disability studies, that tracks pretty well. Um, it, it, this is not just true about the United States, but practically anywhere in the world. Um, part of the ideology of being American is being able rather than disabled. Disability is one form of exclusion that's pretty consistent across all nationalisms. What about training work and routine? Um, this doesn't seem to be about work in any way. One of the oddest things about the culture industry, um, and they, they allude to this without really drawing the argument out I think this was something that was just starting to happen is the way both entertainment and work were being routinized. In other words, they were um, being trained into routines, disciplined, if you like the kind of Foucauldian language, disciplined into certain streams. Like this is how you entertain. This is how you work so that entertaining yourself is actually in a certain way a form of work. Um, I'll talk about that in terms of how you work on the ad, as well as how what's going on here represents a form of work. Um, first of all, uh, just in Marxist terms, what's going on here represents a form of work because of the work needed the actual labor needed for the people involved here to be able to afford to do any of these things. Um, either they're members of the bourgeois, the bourgeois leisure class, in which case it's the labor of others that affords them the opportunity to be able to go and enjoy themselves, or else they're members of the working uh, or bourgeois working class, in which case it's their own labor that allows them 
to afford to do these things um, because they thankfully have at least some leisure time. And look how desperate they are to spend their leisure time on doing something. Ah, well, how many of us actually spend a lot of our leisure time doing these kinds of wonderful, wild things? It seems as though it's normalizing a sense that leisure time is always like this. But in fact, it's rarely like this for most people. Most people spend most of our leisure time, well, watching TV and seeing ads like this for adventure is everywhere, instead of actually going out and having adventure anywhere. That's important. This stands in for the adventure that you're not having. And by doing that, you have adventure by proxy. The routinization of entertainment gives you a sort of fake adventure, adventure uh, through an avatar of someone else's adventure and trains you to accept that as a kind of adventure of your own so that you forget how drab and how adventureless your own life actually is in the routines of working and being entertained and just the you know ordinariness and deathliness of all of that i told you there were no more nice stories i mean i did warn you yes again we drill the sucker into your head Now we have to talk about all these young fascists in this ad. Even that guy that looks like a young Santana? Let me go back to young Santana. There he is. He does look a little like young Carlos Santana. That's hilarious. Um, the, I think there's a better image of him. This one. Ah, couldn't quite get it. Anyway, you know what I mean? There we go. There. Don Carlos Santana, somehow miraculously in 2022, uh, climbing a rock in a Chevy Silverado ad. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so fascism, uh, it breeds well on the basis of individualism because individualism and libertarianism uh, fit together so well. Um, uh, fascism basically is the idea that uh, state power wielded in a kind of absolute way um, will, um, will assure the maximization of the individual's uh, freedom and liberty provided that those individuals have the individual power uh, to act as they see fit. Um, so it fits into this idea that, that those persons, um, that the only obstacle to their being able to do exactly what they want to do at all times everywhere is this little group over here that if only they were got rid of, everything would be fine and these people could do exactly what they want. Right? Just get rid of that group and that group and I can do anything I want, which is what freedom really means, according to these people who have this fascist tendency, this fascist libertarian tendency. It's an individualist concept of liberty and freedom. Um, it's so individualist that it forgets that we're part of a, social group, a collective group, that we live with other people and that liberty can't be that in the context of there being other people around. Right? Liberty can't be absolute right to do anything you damn well please when there are other people around. The only way to make that happen is if you have some kind of fascist regime that gets rid of the people you don't want around so that you can then do whatever you want to do. 
fascism really works well with people who have the kind of uh, anger and resentment of these intruding others, um, because it uses that hatred, um, not for the sake of those people's desires, but for the sake of the um, consolidation of power of the fascist regime, which is how it leads to um, Fuhrerism, the, the rise of an absolute ruler. Slogans do that very well as, as well. Um, adventure is everywhere means jack squat, right? It doesn't mean anything. Uh, I'm sitting in my study at home, which I refer to um, fans of Dr. Strangelove will know why. Uh, I refer to it as the war room. Um, I was trying to change the nickname of it. Um, and the, the last good candidate was the oubliette and um, it was decided that Oubliette was a little too either grim or um, uh, just sort of suggestive. And so we it, it's just reverted back to the war room again. Um, in the war room, there are, I don't know, something like 2,000 books and um, a handful of guitars, um, a couple of laser printers. Um, um, oh, a desk, um, a couple of computers, my phone, tablet, uh, about 50 fountain pens, pencils, um, the CDs of one of the uh, Bach Brandenburg concertos that I have, the Cafe Zimmerman, super weird. Um, Guitar pedals. Yeah, having an adventure. It's adventurous. I, you know, everyday life doesn't need to be an adventure, does it? I'm, and if it was, how awful would that be? I mean, if making breakfast was an adventure, would be kind of awful if you know uh, i like to go for walks and when it's cold because i'm not a cold weather weather cyclist if going for a walk i mean it's really windy today i might make an adventure i don't want adventures when i'm going on a walk i just want to like, go for a walk if i'm going on an adventure i'm expecting you know to need to be armed or you know carry rope and you know, have a helmet on? And, th and why is this guy not wearing a helmet for crying out loud? Carlos, if you fall, who will write and play Oye Como Va? Come on, dude. Anyway, so you see how various of these things are built into even just this simple little ad. Um, just to give you an example, though, of how the cultural product, the advertisement, has predictability and consumability. As soon as you see that symbol, you know, oh, yeah, we know what it's going to be. It presents ideology, which has a, is a form of cultural power, because it tells you how to think about life. It tells you how to think about what a Chevrolet is and how to think about your life. It says all these things are good. Chevrolets are good. Going out with your friends and going uh, kayaking and uh, rock climbing without a helmet with young Carlos Santana is good and all these things. Uh, rock climbing with young Carlos Santana would be really cool. It attacks your perception with 37 different frames uh, in a, a minute, in, a, in 30 seconds less than a second per it routinizes both entertainment and has you think about work and entertainment as as fused together while at the same time telling you that they are separate it emphasizes individuality in a way that doesn't show you how that incorporates a kind of link towards fascist ways of thinking it 
it leads you to think about in, about your own life individualistically without telling you with, that's pushing you ever closer towards fascism. And it gives you minimized language, a language that doesn't give you a way into thinking about what's going on. Just slogans that say nothing, in particular, nothing about the product, but ads never tell you anything about a product anyway, um, that lead us closer to the practically worship of a singular figure, uh, a person who will seem to be uh, a leader that is absolute and needs to be absolute. So there, I hope that makes sense. I hope that that helps give you a little bit of a concrete example to bounce some Horkheimer and Adorno around on. Be careful though, they're both dead, they might crumble. <laughs>